Hey everyone, History Mystery Man here. Super excited today to bring you part two of the Bettenhausen story. In the meantime, if you like the content you're receiving here, please like, share, and comment. I'd love to hear from you. What I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, either way, be glad to hear from you and rest assured you'll definitely get a response back from me. And please hit the subscribe button in the lower right of all my videos. Need to get those subscribers up so I can make sense of all this. In the meantime, how do you like that house in the background. Is that cool or what? Yeah, that's the Manor House here in Toledo, Ohio, built by R.A. and Paige Stranahan back in 1936 through 1938 during the Great Depression. Used all local laborers to get it done. Fascinating story. Uh, the Stranahans were the founders of the Champion Spark Plug Company, a brand you very well may be familiar with, but that's where they lived in the Manor House. It's now a public park and you can go inside. It's so cool. Uh, you got to do it. What a, what a beautiful day, by the way. Just a beautiful winter's day. I'm so excited. Please enjoy part two of the Bettenhausen story. I'm so lucky because I have, I have a feeling that not many men experience. And that, that feeling is, you know, in competition, when you look at a guy and you go, I could beat your butt with one arm tied behind my back. <laughs> well, you know what? I can beat your butt with that arm not even on. And, uh, and I think of I think of the night that he beat Bill Engelhart in the last lap, the last corner. And that's after you were driving with a hook. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but it just I to have done that. I mean, how many how many people in their life have done something that nobody else has ever done? I know, and you, I know it's so neat that you consider yourself so lucky. But I hear you say that, Merle. Yet you lost, you know, both brothers. Your brother lost well, his not, wife. He I, lost I, your I'm father. Not, and, I mean, and, I've and, had some, and, some things surrounding me, but I'm, I'm saying that lives in my soul right now. Understood. I have feelings and accomplishments. Uh, as, as trifle as they might be to the average person that's not a race driver, but, but that doesn't matter what they think of it. I know what I think of what I did. Well, what a night that must have been. You're, you're racing with one arm, and you beat Billy, er, uh, Billy Englehart last lap, coming off turn four to the checkered flag. He I mean, every lap. And, and what, what that had to have been so magical? Oh, that's why I think of it every day. I mean... That does come back to you every day? Every day of my life, I think of it. That is so cool. It, because that night... I, I learned how to drive a race car. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I drove better with one arm than I did with two. Now, granted, some tracks, uh, I mean, I, I ran fourth at Winchester with one arm in a midget, 30 lap race. It's, it's so hard to explain driving a race car, but, but you have so many things going on in your mind and your car, and is it pushing, is it loose, is it, you know, do I use more gas, less gas, driving it? I mean, really, you, you, you do, it looks so easy out there watching it. And Sometimes it, it does. Those in-car cameras of NASCAR races, they turn the wheel yeah. about three inches, yeah. and it looks like they're driving down I-65. But, but what they don't know is all that you're doing is one thing, but now you take all that w what you are doing and make it faster than the other 19 guys that are surrounding you. Well, and let's be clear about one thing. Racing today is way easier than it was. Well, I mean, you get you come from that era, no, no roll cages, right. not full roll cages, the right. roll bar, uh, no power steering, right. um, the car, skinny hard tires. Yeah. Racing was way harder then than it is now. Let's yeah. just put yeah. that right out yeah. there. Well, they drive like Cadillacs now. Yeah, and and the the I don't know that how many guys get in a midget or sprint car at night, yeah, and think that they could possibly get killed to make a mistake, but. But that was from your era. Run. It happened yeah. all the time. Every time you, every time you sat in a race car, might be you. Yeah. Or your brother. Right. Or, or anybody else. I, and, and, and see, and, and see, this conversation go on forever. But it's just like the, the windscreen now, and the, and the, and, you know, and, I mean.
You can't even see the driver anymore. Yeah. All you see is a little bubble. But uh, of their maybe, other maybe helmet. the reason there's not as many people out there anymore because it looks like they're all driving Sherman tanks and and the same and, and car. They watch them crash and nothing happens to them. I mean, we all know that probably thirty percent of the or forty percent of people that used to go to the sprint car races, they didn't go to get see somebody get killed. But they sure would like to see a good flip so they could talk about driving home and drinking. No a doubt about it. You know what, Bill France, I heard a, I was in a conversation once with Ken Squire, the broadcaster. He used to run in the circles with Bill France Sr. and all those guys. And he told me a story once, Ken Squire did, that Bill France Sr. hated safety because he thought that that's why people were buying tickets to see these daredevils risk their life each and every day. He did not support the safety that, that eventually came, but he didn't like it. It's true. I mean, it, it, it's true. And now you got you got a car going around and you go, What's, is, is that remote control or is there something <laughs> else? So I'm enjoying this so much. I'm going to back up just a second, though. There is one story. I'm going back to the old farm again. The, the whole thing fascinates oh, me. Okay. Yeah. But, but you weren't allowed, uh, your dad didn't allow you kids uh, to to participate in extracurricular activities at school because you had to be home for dinner because your family sat around the table and ate dinner together. Now, I, th I really believe that all families should do that. What would it have been to have been at that table and listened to you guys to hear, right. hear the family talk? Yeah, and, it, and it was everything. Because uh, you had, I mean, all through this, we started farming in, I think, 1955 or 1956. Well, let us let me tell you the story. It's the only way you can, it all makes sense to you. My mom decides she wants to buy the farm, so we get the farm. My dad spends two years rebuilding, full basement, or I mean, remodeled the inside, excuse me, everything. And so, and when my dad won the uh, champ, national championship in 51, yep. He, when it was AAA. Yeah. He had had a Kaiser Fraser dealership after World War II. Well, they went out of business in 1950, and Amal Andrews knew some uh, manufacturers, and he got a Chrysler Plymouth franchise. So my dad decides, well, let's take um, the national family. So he gets, in, he gets in partnership with his older brother, Herb, the one that originally had the had the farm and, and was there when the barn burned down, and his sister's brother, Al Schult. Now, Al was a businessman. Herb had a John Deere implement store. So the three of them got together and they, they formed a corporation called uh, Bettenhausen and Schult Chrysler Plymouth John Deere implement store. So they were kitty corner across the street from other, each other in Tinley Park. So the three of them were partners. They sold Chrysler Plymouths on this corner, and they sold, sold John Deere implants across there. Now, we got 60 acres, but our cousin's farming it for us, sharecropping it, cash rent, whatever it might have been. And that's very common. You buy a farm and have somebody else do the farm work for you. So we're going along. My dad's still racing. And uh, I'll never forget him. I, and, and, and it was a good relationship, but Herb had never been out of the state of Illinois. And they, th you know, my dad's thinking at 300 miles an hour. <laughs> Everything he does, he, <laughs> I mean, faster, better, quicker, more. And these He guys, chose the right profession. Well, Tony, let's see what we're going to do. Let's think about this a little bit. And, then, and you know, he wants to be gone out of the building already while they're still sitting. So it, it just didn't work. There were too many, too many mines involved. So in 1956, they decided, okay, we're going to liquidate this, this partnership. Now, we've been living on the farm since 51, so we've been there five years, going to school, uh, doing the, the little league and everything else. And oh, lo and behold, they, they split the dealership dealership up. My get, dad got two tractors. He got a combine. He got a, a plow. And here I'm 
uh, 56, I'm, I'm 13, Gary's 15. And so we're on a farm. Why do we have somebody else farm? We can take this farm machinery and, and I can make farmers off of, out of my kids. And he truly said this. He said, I really did it to keep my kids off the street and teach them responsibility and, uh, and wow, hard work. Those are now great we had lessons. been working, he had, he had stuff for us to do every day, whether we had a farm there or not. He, he always had projects. Yeah, I, I can believe that. So, uh, so we end up, and I remember, and we got about seven cars too, I think, seven used cars. So we're, now we're in the, in, in the farm business. Well, my dad can't, he never dipped his toe in anything. I mean, it, he dove in head first if he's going to do something. <laughs> so, so what we need, we don't have enough tractors. We need a better combine. All right, so now we're officially farming. And he checks with his neighbor, hey, you want me to farm your, I can do your farm. So we go from 60 acres to 80 acres to 100 acres to, and buy a few more tractors. And, and then we, then a guy's, uh, was getting on the farm business one, and, and his house wasn't any good, so we bought their gr gra their granary and we moved it down <laughs> to our place. Yeah. I mean, it, Head it, first. it's just the way he wanted. Nothing, you know, it, he always had to have the best, do the most, and to carry it forward. Now, this is 56. In 1961, in May when he died, we were farming 540 acres. Wow. Oh my God! And plus, and, and and it's it's forty acres here, it's sixty acres there. It, we had one piece that had one hundred and eighty acres, but other than that, we had to move the farm machinery all he, around. The your your dad there. was a working machine. Yeah, I mean, well, but he, you know what? Now, hey, we're seventeen and nineteen. That's he, he, had age. <laughs> yeah, he had some help. Yeah, he had he had some help. Okay, okay. Do, do you you know? Do you remember? Like, I've, uh, growing up, I think some of your earliest racing memories were like of uh, um, Raceway Park and Soldier Field, yes? Soldier I mean, Field. You, Soldier I, Field I, I, in Chicago. Okay, no, Soldier no, Field. I went to Raceway Park. So before, I've yeah. seen some of those old photos of Soldier Field, yeah. which is where they play football now. Right. Uh, it looked like, it's a little race, but it looked like uh, it was an NFL game. There was that many people there. Unbelievable. 90,000 90, people there. Uh, uh, well, Can you imagine well, here's, here's, for a jalopy race? Here's what happened. For five years of war, it ended. What were you going to do? There wasn't there wasn't eighty nine different ad, you know uh, sporting events going on. I, even if there was, Merle, I got to tell you, I'm going to Soldier Field. Yeah, I mean, I want to yeah, see it. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable. And then midget racing there my was dad, very very popular. My dad almost got killed there in a midget race in 1954. Uh, leading their ace and the brake cylinder blew out going in the turn he went up over a guy's wheel and went and they I mean it, it, it's like a, a really nice football field that's what it was but it had a high concrete wall and then the stands were about that was perfect went right into the concrete wall broke his shoulder had a concussion a did, did he so I know he wouldn't pull you out of school to go to the races but when you guys weren't in school or obliged to do something else responsible wise were you did you go to all the races were you allowed to go we went to most of them that had let i want to say like indy car races champ car races the coin springfield milwaukee my favorites uh, those were the, the the during the summer the ones we we got to go through went to the speed and went to indy of course uh Went to most of the midget races if they were weekends and different things. Did your sister Susan go? Was she yeah. allowed? Yeah, but not as much as we did. She yeah. was too, she was younger and and it, you know you're racing, you're going racing back then and you got two kids with you know and they're that's hard. Diapers and yeah yeah then they're yeah. then they're two boys running around. Right, right. <laughs> doing what we shouldn't be doing, even sure. though we were told sure. not to. Yeah, yeah, I get it. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we went to a lot of the races, uh, especially uh, Tinley Park, Soldier Field, that's 30 miles, so. Uh, you know, I want to just mention your mother, um, Valerie. Um, so, so I know in the beginning days of racing for Tony in the late 30s and such, it was, that was a brutal business back then. People died all the time. 
and the relationship between your mother and father became strained. They separated, but they remarried in, I think, 1940. And I thought, wow, that must be something there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. She was, she was only like 16 or 17 when they got married. And, uh, and then they, and he, I mean, he never did sow his wild oats, but it, they, they were running overboard there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At first. And then, then they got back together. But, uh, um, when did your mother pass away? 2001. Oh, wow. I would love to sat down with her yeah. and, and, and listen to her mind. 2001, 2002. Yeah, because uh, she was 81. Yep. We talked about your dad. You know, he was the uh, national champion in 1951 for the, for the Indy cars, champ right. cars. And again, in 1958, he was the national champion. Right. Uh, it was USAC by now in, in 58. In that era, through the 50s and tapping into the early 60s, your dad was a racing superstar. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was he to you? Just somebody that yelled at you because you didn't do something <laughs> right. I mean, seriously, he never, he never, you didn't know he drove race cars when he was at, at the farm because he was too busy trying to teach us from being bad kids. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the truth. And uh, and we did most of the work. I mean, he, I mean, he helped every now and then. But he, he, you know that book you got there? Yeah. That, that he'd leave one of those for us when he left stuff we had to do <laughs> a, a book <laughs> it, it wasn't just a one pager <laughs> single spaced <laughs> he left the book <laughs> so he, he didn't want he told he, oh, said well. he didn't want us to be on the streets and so he did but uh no it, but did you know your dad was a superstar i mean people he, gloated over him at the track and uh, but he wasn't away from the track. I mean, he was just a guy. Like I know. Saying, I could take you to this building where it was it was Cabot's drugstore, and they had a they had a, a counter there. You could get sandwiches, and uh, they crisp the best Manhattan sandwich you could get in town, the best cherry pie with ice cream on it, <laughs> and coffee. And he'd go in there and sit and just BS with everybody in town. And, yeah, but and he, he wasn't he wasn't a star away from well. He, he wasn't the star at the track, except to the other drivers. I mean, he nobody needled more, you know, and and and. <laughs> so the, he had to get the people. the adoration from the fans. I mean, yeah. they they were they were they were gladiators. They were, yeah. they really were back then. And the era was so dangerous. I mean, I see those photos of your father with his open face leather Cromwell helmet that did very little to protect a driver, maybe a lap belt. They were often tossed from the seat. They had they, they, no power steering, skinny, hard tires. The cars didn't handle as precisely as they do today. Um, they had to often reach their arm outside the race car to not only, you know, pump the mechanical fuel pump, but they had the handbrake outside. I mean, and what an era. I mean, I, I, I don't understand or why they even did it because so many people died doing it. But I think about how much personality, grit, and character uh, that era had because when Tony Bettenhausen drove by, you could see the expression on his face. Yeah. How cool would that be? All I see now is a helmet. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just not... Uh, racing today is not anywhere close to being as interesting as it was. Well, here, here, I'll tell you how it went, Okay. Everybody was World War II, and there's a whole list of drivers that were were World War II pilots and uh, developed some pretty tough guys. Well, they no, got back no and, doubt. And and you know Indy 500 and race cars, and so guys start driving race cars. And if you if you check through the record book, there weren't a lot of old race drivers. And the reason huh. there the reason and it didn't last that well, long. Well, here's here's what happened. You know, there's an old saying, you know, you love to write, you love it when people write nice things about you and tell you how great you are. But the main thing is you don't ever believe it. And that's, here's what, this, this, this happens so often. Guy comes, starts racing, all once he gets a USAC sprint car, or midget or whatever, and he has a couple good races, then he wins a race, and they, the words of greatness and the next um, um, Rex Mays, Ted Horn. Uh, great, uh, great, 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 yeah, great. Yeah. So, so he goes out so, and he knows how fast he should go, but man, he is so good now, he can do a little bit more. And when you did a little bit more, then 
you ended up dead because you had no safety to, to protect you, to, to let you make more than one mistake. And, and both those drivers you just mentioned, Rex Mays yeah. died at Del Mar, California. Right. Ted Horn died Duco. at DuCoin. Right. Yep. Right. I mean. And, and but mm -hmm. there was so, so, I mean, you know, the, the old saying, there's old race drivers and there's bold race drivers, but there's not very many old bold race drivers because you don't last very long. Except one that really comes to mind, old and bold, Raleigh Beal. Yeah. He was, he did not take a lot of risks, unnecessary risks right. in the car. And he was very good at finishing races. He yeah. didn't crash right. unless someone else caused it, but he was really, really good. Uh, he wanted to live. Yes. And he, by God, he did. And he, he could win tomorrow, not today. But, yeah, yeah. But, and, 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 now, but, but see, there's my dad, and he was one, but he wasn't, he was bold. He just, he was 43 years old. If you look through the Bettenhausen book and you look at what, what he did in 1960, how many races he won, and, and at 43 years old, and, and most, I mean, what's Raleigh won his championship at 43. You know, yeah. We almost felt like, well, God likes my dad, and that's not going to happen to him, and you know, and then, you know. But you knew it could. Oh, in yeah. fact, I read in the book, your sister Susan, her, uh, her only prayer in life was to keep my father alive, mm -hmm. and she didn't get her prayers answered because... Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 so the story goes, it's, it's 1961 at the Brickyard, the Indianapolis 500. Your dad really is the favored that month. Yes. He was in a car that was very capable of winning that race. He, as a driver, knew he could win it. Right. Um, he was the favored driver, and at the last minute, he, he, Paul Russo, his very good friends, comes up and says, hey, my car isn't handling well. It's a mess. Will you just take a few? Can you... I mean, you think about that. So Tony says, oh, sure, I will. He hops in the car and practice. You, could you imagine that happening today? Like, <laughs> like a Target or a Ganassi driver getting in a Penske car because the Penske, <laughs> hey, man, the thing isn't handling. Yeah. It just, that's what was so cool about that era. So he gets in that car, and he takes a few laps. He's coming down the front stretch, and like a 15-cent bolt falls off, and, yeah. and the steering Lincolns or something, well, the car turns right into the wall. and That's a tie rod in it. It was a castle nut, and the castle nut was in Cotterkey because Doug Sterley's mechanic wasn't back at the racetrack yet. He was arriving that afternoon. So so, that's so we're, we're down to a Cotterkey now? Yeah, Cotterkey. How much does a Cotterkey cost? <laughs> Two cents? Not even that, probably. By, so, by, the, <laughs> by the gross. <laughs> uh, but the, here, now, I'll, I'll take that story even farther. Remember I told you my dad didn't put his big toe in anything? He drove into it? Head first. Well... We were farming, right, 1959, 19, and we had a wet year, so we, when you take corn and sell it, if it's got a lot of moisture in it, they dock you 10 cents uh, uh, for every percent of moisture. So instead of getting like $1.50 a, a, a bushel, you could end up getting a dollar a bushel for it. So my dad says, thinks, well, if we get a corn dryer, we dry our own corn, we'll, uh, and store it, we can sell it whatever we want then, but you can't store it if it's wet because it molds. So he, he builds a granary. Then we want to build a, uh, we want to add on to the, to the dryer, because we added the, the dryer to the big granary. My dad's working for Champion Highway Safety Program, going to schools, teaching kids how to drive safely. This is, <laughs> a, this is 1960, in the fall of 1960. Well, you know what? Uh, my kids are pretty good, but they're still kids. So I'm going to have a guy come up and be a ramrod while they're there. So Paul Russo lived with us from December until April of 1960. I have Paul Russo's autograph. I'm sorry to... Yeah. Go ahead. So, so he was my dad leading up to the when this all took place in May. So he... Can you imagine how he felt? I mean, oh, I, I mean, so I can't. he's out there. We're, we're putting this new elevator leg in and a new and a new bin to store things, and uh, so they were more than friends. I mean, they, I know they were just uh, so. But it's just it's just some things are, and <laughs> you don't know why. But uh, well, but uh, so I was meaning that he he. We were farming 540, but he was getting ready to, to farm 740, wow. you know, with the farming. And 
uh, all of all that. Well, I mean, I I hope this isn't an inappropriate question, no, and, and if if it is, I mean, just yeah. just say so. But I mean, do you remember? exactly what you were doing where you were and who told you about your father's death i mean is this like a john kennedy moment for you that something oh, exactly what, what what tell me about it well we my dad if you remember back in back in the day hang on